Hi, I'm Sam Nelson. I'm the director for the Center for Entrepreneurship here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. I'm being joined by John Wirtz, and I'm going to have John introduce, get, tell a little bit more about himself. So. Sure. Yeah, I'm John Wirtz. I'm the chief product officer at Huddle. Um, I founded Huddle about 17 years ago after finishing my undergrad here at the University of Nebraska and my MBA here. So John, you have experience with the Nebraska Center for Entrepreneurship. Can you kind of walk us through what that journey was like for you? Yeah, so it started for me in undergrad. Um, I was in the Rake School with David and Brian, my two co-founders at Huddle, but this was well, well before Huddle. And we were thinking about business ideas, knew that we kind of wanted to start something up, but weren't sure you know, if we had found the right idea and hadn't found something that really got us passionate until kind of going into our fifth year, we stayed and did an MBA okay. straight after undergrad and started coming up with the idea for Huddle, the early versions of it, and thought we might be onto something, but had no idea how to start a business, how to write a business plan. Um, and so as we started exploring that and letting people know we're thinking about this, we kind of quickly got connected to the center to get us help. And so we sat down with the team here at the time and got a ton of help on how to write a business plan, and then also got exposed to the business plan competition seen in the new venture competition here as like a great way to you know, put that business plan to the test and go get some feedback and learn. Can you walk me through uh, what the competition was like when you did it and, and just kind of what you learned from that first one? Yeah, it already, even then, so this would have been 2006, it was very global. So there's teams coming in from, let's say across the country and even I think a couple from outside the country coming in for the competition. There was few like it, so it was really cool that Nebraska was out ahead of the curve on the competition. So I remember being blown away by the kind of diversity of the teams from where they were from. Um, getting to watch some of them pitch was like eye-opening just on this whole world of other students out there trying to create these high growth companies. Um, and then David and Brian and I are really competitive people. So as soon as we entered a competition, we're in it to win it. Sure. So it was a good driver for us to get the business plan dialed in, um, sharpened up, you know, make sure that when you read it, the idea really hit you and where we were trying to take it. Um, we really got our demo and our prototype of the actual product dialed in even further than what we had shown to the Husker football team okay. at the time so that we could you know, demo it during the business plan competition so the judges could see, like, here's what we're actually talking about. So is this, the business plan competition became this awesome catalyst for us just to like, sharpen the idea and think it through more deeply, um, model out what we would do with our first you know, raise, um, and then we also got connected through the center to kind of the circuit of business plan competitions around the country. So ended Did up- Did you go compete in other ones then? Or? Yeah, so then okay. we ended up competing in San Diego, which was another one of the big ones okay. um, at the time. And uh, then in the Big 12 competition at the time, which back when Nebraska's in the Big 12. Um, and then there's a couple other ones. So in the end, so we won the new venture competition here, which was an awesome, just confidence booster and helped you know, get us fired up then went and won in San Diego. And across four or five competitions we competed in, with this one in San Diego being the biggest for sure, we ended up winning around like 60 or $70,000 in essentially like free, no equity yeah. needed seed money that got the company started. So, so back to the initial competition, what was the format here then? What is, was it a 15 minute presentation, 10 Q and A, do you remember? I'm having to go deep, Yeah, deep on the memory. I think it was pretty similar, yeah, similar format, just in terms of the fundamentals, like get up and pitch. We got to demo the product, I know, so we had some slides and got to demo the product up on you know, the screen um, and then take questions for yeah, a short period of time. I think it was pretty pretty similar kind of framing, yeah. you know, multi-round to make it into the finals. So you get, we were able to get two or three reps, probably more than three or four reps of going through the pitch over the course of the competition, which is also awesome, like you don't, get to kind of pitch your business in succession quickly like that um, in quite the same way as you do at a competition. So I, I love that idea of we could pitch, we got this feedback, we went back, we honed it, tweaked it, you know, come back in, try to pitch better were, the next time. Were there any th components of the competition prior to actually getting in and competing that you guys were concerned about or the things that maybe you went in a little nervous about? I think I'm just trying to think back on it. We felt confident in kind of the technology was something that we were working on with the Huskers and getting good feedback from the Husker football team and the coaches at the time. So that felt like we were, we could really speak to that. It was starting to progress. 
the part I can remember being a little more nervous around was like the idea of, is this a fundable business? What does the business model look like? Knowing our numbers really well, because we just created the business plan. So getting kind of grilled on margins and numbers and those, those things I think were more on our mind um, and less so about, you know, we felt really great about talking about the product. And w with that, was there any like really crucial pieces of feedback you received from the business plan competition that you made some immediate adjustments on or maybe you didn't wish you would have? I know, I know we got a, a bunch of great feedback. I'm trying to think of kind of specifically what, you know, what it would have been. And honestly, part, the parts that I remember are more just the kind of positive energy from the judges being this kind of fuel to keep us getting after it. I know there's questions around kind of market size and scale. Okay. And so that was something that we, we were always kind of reflecting on. And it ended up, you know, we were going after Division I athletics and pro, pro football and Division I football really to start. And so we got, we got a lot of questions around, like, is that a big enough market? There's 32 NFL teams, you know, I think 117 Division I football teams at the time in our business plan. I remember that number. Um, and so it was like the beginnings of thinking about maybe there's some other markets. And it was two years later that Huddle pivoted into high school and kind of small college in that market. And I definitely could tie some of those threads back to the early business plan competitions where we were getting feedback from judges on the challenges of going after a really tight yeah, really small market, market yeah. initially. Speak, well, that's a great segue. I mean, can you walk us through where, where's Huddle today? What are you, what are you guys doing? Yeah, um, so today we're, we have offices, I think now across 17 countries around the world. We're at about 4,000 employees. We work with over a couple hundred thousand teams, sports teams around the world. The core idea, though, is the same, which which is always really it's exciting for us to think about and talk about. Like, sure, the guts of the idea. I, I literally went and looked back through the business plan uh, the other day. Um, just it's kind of fun to see what we're talking about, and and a lot of it really holds up pretty well. It's like this idea of in sports, video is so important for communication. And at the time, coaches were burning a lot of DVDs, or just really struggling to use the video they had. So this idea of moving it online, let the team collaborate around it. It's still kind of the the core of what we're doing today. The big new areas we're pushing into today are camera systems. I, I would have never imagined at the time that we would be building hardware, but we yeah, are. Like smart cameras um, to capture sports footage that you attach to your gym or your press box. And then the fan facing side was something we had as like you know, kind of at the back of the business plan. Like what might be next is if we have all this content for teams, how could we use it with fans? And today that's, you know, that's now like a huge investment that we're making is live streaming to to parents and fans, getting highlights out there, schedules, scores, stats, rosters. Very so, cool. Uh, what, you know, as you as you think about not only the future of Huddle, but now, what have been some of the biggest shifts you've seen personally from changes in technology? And then what does that look like going forward? So what, what's been some of the big shifts for you guys from a technology standpoint that's changed yeah. since you started? Because if I heard you correctly, value proposition has stayed the same, right? You're leveraging video technology to allow teams to collaborate, learn, and give them that type of competitive edge. Yep. And so what what have you had to do to keep up with the changes in that type of technology? It sounds like you're in hardware now. It's part yeah. of it. The so. big, I mean, the, the next big technology wave that came, so getting video into the cloud was what we based the business off of, like that transition, and okay. that really paid off. Then the next wave was mobile, and that was huge for us. So now these teams and coaches could capture video wherever they were at, just get their phone out. Um, and tablets were like the perfect device for, for Huddle to function on for coaches. So yeah, so that was fantastic. I'd say the wave that we're really in right now is like hardware enabling the platform to do what it does. So this idea of smart cameras, wearables on the athlete, like how can we put hardware technology out there that just lets all this content flow into Huddle and then we work our magic off of it. The other big technology change is just how fast you can move video now. So before in Huddle, it's like, can we just get the video up and have it kind of ready for you the next morning, essentially? Um, now it's, how can we have it ready for you within seconds so that you can use it on the field to make decisions or so mom and dad can watch the game as it's happening? Or how could we create a highlight package so when halftime hits, we've got the halftime recap auto-generated done that just shows up in the live stream. So you're seeing the kind of things you'd see on an ESPN broadcast, but no production truck needed, no staff needed. It just happens like, that's what technology is really enabling. And I think the other big one, I know it sounds like buzzwords, but it's true in our space. We've been investing in it for, for a long time is AI and machine learning in sure. particular. Like yeah. 
what you can do with computer vision and machine learning on a massive amount of sports video like we have is really exciting. So I think we're just just starting to unlock that. And I mean, to tie that back to the center and what I'm hearing happening at the university, like hearing students thinking about data science, decision science, machine learning, AI, and how, how that can plug into new businesses. Like To me, this is a great place for students to be able to explore that, but also figure out how to, does it connect to a business model? How do I create competitive advantage? Like It's an area that everyone's talking about, but the great ideas are going to have you know, a killer business model and a competitive moat built around them. And um, so that's what we've tried to do at Huddle is go after AI and machine learning, but our competitive moat is our expertise in sports and this massive library of content that we can use to train and you know, build models off of. Cool. You, you kind of answered uh, the first part of my next question. I was going to ask you, you know, what you what you would value in a student that you hire at Huddle that comes out of the entrepreneurship program, whether it's ours or someone else. I heard a little bit about the ability to connect, you know, technologies like AI to business models. So that's something we yeah. take pride in is really exposing students to the business model canvas and thinking through value propositions and, and doing that through both coursework and the co-curricular activities that we have. But are there other things that you think you know, if you reflect on your experience and predominantly as we talked was in the co-curricular side of the house, but when you think about what we teach in the, in the curriculum as well as the co-curricular stuff, are there things you would love to see in our students that you think they should be getting from our curriculum and our co-curricular stuff? Yeah, I think the center, I, I love what the center focuses on already in the curriculum. I mean, number one, honestly, is kind of just this attitude and mindset of scrappiness and, you know, to get things off the ground You've got to figure out how you kind of use this little thing to love, you know, give you a leg up on this thing to build on this thing and, and build your way up because you're, you're never going to start yeah. with size or scale as your edge. So that's what I love is if I'm talking to a student that's applying at Huddle or talking to us about a job and they've been in the center and they've tried to start something themselves, like I get to see this level of scrappiness, um, kind of lack of fear or ability to push through the fear of kind of the unknown and am I capable of this to go give it a shot. So I love that. Like the other thing I love about students that are going through the center is they've had experience selling, pitching yeah. something. And that's, I think, so, so powerful. Looking back on the business plan competitions, a big part of the value is just getting yourself out there and having to sell to these judges that we should be winning. This is a winning business plan, whatever it is. I mean, at Huddle, that's 90% of what I've done for the last 17 years is sell and pitch something, like selling our first employees and joining the team, obviously selling our product to sports teams. But early on, it's me in the room convincing them this little startup is the system they should go through to power their football team or soccer team, selling investors on investing, like that, that is what it is. So I, I love that students in the curriculum here are getting real reps at pitching and selling ideas, services. Optimally, I mean, the advice I always give the students is if you can get out and literally go sell something for money, like in exchange, that's just such an awesome experience to get and deal with objections and get punched in the gut a little bit and get through it. And I think students in the center are getting that kind of real experience. Good. Um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, where do you see this Nebraska Center for Entrepreneurship in term, its role in terms of economic development for not only Lincoln, but the, the state of Nebraska? Yeah, I think we've got, I think about it as we've got this massive amount of talent at the university and we need, the Center for Entrepreneurship is a key linchpin to unlock so much of the, the power of it. You know, the university is naturally kind of built to have a bit of silos but by design for a good reason. Like we've got colleges that need to go deep in a given area, but you have to have centers like the Center for Entrepreneurship that can cut through that and connect students with each other. I mean, startups that are gonna be really disruptive are gonna need people with skill sets in technology or in ag, but also on the business side and in marketing and in advertising. Um, and it's not going to happen naturally, easily within the colleges. You, you've got to catalyze and bring that together. So I see that as a huge part of the continued role for the center is like mashing passionate students together with different skill sets that can start these things. Or even if they don't become the startup founding team, they can unlock these other students and professors can unlock that founder's blocking point. Um, and so I think the Center for Entrepreneurship, yeah, is just a great example of that. And probably it's still at the beginnings. I know when we yeah. talk about it, there's still so yeah. much more yeah. we can do. But I think that's a great reputation to have is kind of a, a silo crusher, glue connector mechanism. 
and you're housed here in the College of Business, which is a phenomenal place to be, but we're about so much more than the College of Business. And I think that's becoming known. Good. Like this isn't just a this isn't just a college of business center. This is a university and a community you know, center. Yeah, I mean, it's it's good to hear that. I mean, what, we know we have a long ways to go, but I think we've seen a lot of growth. Well, we we I know we have. I mean, the numbers show it. We've seen growth from involvement from the other colleges. And I always tell folks, I mean, the best co- classes I see are the ones that uh, have a broad representation of students from different disciplines because they... Totally they look at problems differently. And when you get multiple minds together thinking about a problem and they bring a different discipline and a different way of thinking to it, they get better solutions out of the deal. And yeah. so it's kind of why, more of that. I mean, why come here to campus and be all together if you're not gonna interact, if you're gonna go to your college yeah. and sit in your college, then why be on a campus? Like, yep. that's, you know, the idea is to have these collisions and smash together and collaborate, but it doesn't happen without work. And it doesn't happen without having a center and dedicated people to kind of help break down the silos that always naturally form, and we have them at Huddle, too. What would you tell um, students that are, this is two two-part question, students that haven't engaged in, with the Center for Entrepreneurship and uh, or an entrepreneurship course, what do you think would be the easiest way for them to engage? Um, any words of advice for them? What should they do? Yeah, I think two things are coming to mind. One is it's just a lot of fun. Like, Getting to think about how you bring an idea to life, I think is, it's a lot of fun and it can be hard to, to see that. You hear the word entrepreneurship, it's like this big French word, like what, it, what is this about? But understanding this is about how do you take an idea within a company, outside a company, whatever it might be, and, and bring it to life and what are the hurdles you're gonna have to go, go through. And so I think if more students could understand what that feels like and looks like to get to do it and practice it, they could realize how, how fun that is. It's really yeah. collaborative, it's really fun. And then the second is kind of back to what we were talking about, about how Huddle you know, values the skills that are coming out of the center. Like It's just such valuable fundamental skills, I think, to have, to be able to think about customer development and understanding a customer, or thinking about what it means to sell and pitch, or thinking about the basics of a business model. I mean, at Huddle, some of the best ideas at Huddle come from the most kind of unexpected spots are from all over the company and the people at Huddle that can get those ideas heard and move them forward have they have that kind yeah. of skill set. They can put the page together that the idea kind of jumps off the page because you can see how the puzzle works versus just I've got an idea and that you know that's it. They can they can get people fired up about their idea because they can tell more of the story. How about the ones that have competed a couple times and either A or maybe a little bit frustrated, uh, they're getting some feedback, or just quite aren't sure what to do next. What would you tell What would you tell that student, being someone that's went through the whole process? Yeah. Um, I mean, one, just from personal experience, I know our, with Huddle, we have been able to be on an, an amazing path, you know, getting to launch it externally. I know it can look a little bit like a hockey stick up into the right yeah. view, but we have definitely have had all these companies you kind of look at that look like the up and to the right hockey stick, you know, 99% of them have had way more kind of frustrations and roadblocks than you get to kind of see. So try not to be discouraged by looking externally and feeling like there's all these just success stories and why am I struggling? Like everyone is struggling. They're just trying to portray I'm killing it yeah. externally, yeah. Um, which I like to cut through. So like for us, we burnt through our first raise that we did in the first two years. We were not succeeding. The Huskers were using us, you know, the Jets, a couple others, the business model wasn't working. Luckily, we had investors that were willing to lean back in and invest again and let us take a crack at this pivot into high school. And then I can think of 20 other ideas we've tried that have just completely you know, flopped, many coming from me. So just trying to help them understand there's a lot of these other stories out there from companies even that look really successful that are struggling. As the other is just how can you appreciate the lessons you're getting through those struggles? Those are the best ones, the most memorable ones, the most like actionable ones are the ones where you're trying something, it's not working out, but you're logging that away. When I'm interviewing somebody at Huddle, if those are the stories that they're telling in the interview, like to me, that's really powerful. And we ask about what have been some of your biggest mistakes, what have been some of your biggest failures, and we look for real answers to that. Like, if I'm hearing these really surface level answers about kind of a project that got delivered a little bit late, it's like, are you doing real stuff? Like, are, are you taking real swings? So. I hope that's empowering to them. Like when they go in and talk in these interviews or whatever they're doing next, they're gonna have real stories about taking real bets and 
I think there's a lot of companies, a lot of potential investors that like, that's what they're looking for. Thank you. That's, I love that real swings. I might have to steal that term from you or borrow it yeah. in class. Um, so I'm curious, you've been very gracious with your time. Um, during my entire time at the center, either coming back and speaking in classes, uh, you've served on our advisory board, you'll be chairing our advisory board. Uh, you're always available to us. Why is that important to you? And what would you tell someone else that might be interested, uh, someone else in the business community might be interested in engaging with the center? Why, why do you do it? Why is it, what, what do you get out of it? <laughs> so I, mean, I, get, uh, I get a lot of energy yeah. and ideas just from being around you and the team here. So selfishly, it is great. But I think, I mean, the big reason I do it is I reflect on the people that helped us get started. It's you know being here at the center, the competitions that got us off the ground, people like Jim McClurg, um, and our early executive kind of coaches and advisors that just gave of their time for nothing in, in return. Those are the things that made the difference. Huddle would not be here, I can say that confidently, without those people. And so I definitely feel that it's right to pay that forward and give it, and give it back. So, you know, these, I, I hope my involvement can be an unlock, even if it's just getting to demystify, like what, yeah people who are grown businesses look like and talk like. I mean, I'm just a norm, you know, normal people that are struggling through things still today in their businesses. So that was a lot of it for me, is just if you can be around that and demystify it, it can boost your confidence and help you feel more comfortable. I also get a lot out of it because it's just a really fun group of students to get to work with. Like these are the students that are high energy. They do want to go take big swings. They yep. want to make a difference. Even if it's not necessarily a high growth, scaled technology company, it could be more of a a local business or they're going like after starting up a franchise of their own. Um, they want to take bets. They want to take some risks. They want to, I mean, that's, that's really fun. Um, and the problems you get to work on are very real, which is really fun as, you know, as somebody who's advising. The other piece that's really fun is I think you and the team here take feedback really seriously and then take swings yourselves. I mean, that's what you would hope you'd model with a center and you all definitely do it. So when we're in advising on the board or someone comes in with an idea, I see you all take action and they don't all work, but within three or four months, you're taking a crack at it, whether it's adding a minor or you know, uh, building out a CRM system so we can follow people through their, yep. their paths or trying out a new form of competition, whatever it is, we'll, you know, we'll give it a shot quickly and learn from it. Um, and that's just really fun at other areas where I've, I'm involved, don't move that fast. Ideas sit there. Um, there's a hundred excuses why we can't do something here. It's just, let's smash through that, which is really fun. Cool, oh, appreciate that. We, we always love having you. So is there anything else you would, you would like to add or that you would have to say about the center? Uh, I think when we were talking before about economic impact, like the outsized economic impact here, obviously I'm biased being you know, being a founder, but I think the really outsized economic impact for the state is gonna come from empowering these entrepreneurial students and entrepreneurial minded people that can join them on these teams. They may not be the founder. Like build things that can scale, build things that are disruptive, um, build things that have an eye to the future and where ag is going and communications are going and technology is going in the future. That's what's going to really allow Lincoln and Omaha and Nebraska and other communities across the state be healthy and strong and growing. And so if we're not taking the best talent around the campus and bringing them together around this idea of entrepreneurship and starting things that are disruptive and taking, making big bets and taking risks, then we're not going to be creating yeah. the atmosphere we want and the, the future we want for the state. It's not the only ingredient, but I think it's an incredibly important ingredient. It's kind of the flywheel that a lot of other ingredients are going to you know, kind of come circling around. Cool. Well, thank you, John, for spending yeah. time and sharing your story today. And for those of you listening, I hope you appreciate the words of wisdom John shared with us today. Thank you.